On this week's episode of Devil's Trap Podcast, we talk about fresh blood. No, no, no. We have changed the title. This episode is now called Gordon Sucks. <laughs> Let's do this. episode of devil's trap podcast i'm diana i'm liz who is amused by the fact that diana just surprised herself <laughs> she was like wait i'm recording i'm like yes yes you hit the button that says we're recording. I know, but I, yeah i know no i'm like, called medicine i yes. know but the look of delight on your face you're just like oh <laughs> this is what we're doing now it's time that that happened yeah so hi um so since we've spoken to you last, we have you know, gone on an adventure to New Orleans. Spooky um, New Orleans. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. And we've got an episode to talk about, we've got all kinds of fun stuff. So um, let's jump in with New Orleans and then we'll talk about where we're at now. Okay. Sounds good. Sure. What do you got to say about New Orleans? So uh, we uh, went to New Orleans for the Supernatural Convention um, last weekend. So that was whatever date that was 21st something so, like that. sometime before thanksgiving day 20 the 20th the 20 the weekend of 19th through 21st we were in new orleans uh so we flew in and uh stayed in a lovely spot in the garden district and a converted synagogue that was really freaking cool and it was a really old building and we shopped all around the garden district and uh took uh, rosé breaks like you do when you're shopping in New Orleans or anywhere for that matter. And uh, then had a lovely evening outing to the Peacock Room, uh, which is a beautiful place with lovely cocktails. Um, and uh, then we spent all day Saturday at the Supernatural Convention. Yep. Watching Rob Benedict talk. We saw the lovely ladies of Supernatural. Yep. That was great. So it was Ruth Connell, um, Brian, damn it. Kim Rhodes. <laughs> Kim Rose, I'm like, I was like, wait, what are your actual real names? Your real names, not the, the, not the not people you play. I'm like, I'm like, wait, shit, I don't know. Wait, Brianna, right, you say Brianna Buck. Am I getting close? I feel like I'm sure. getting close. Brianna. Sure. I lost my cheat sheet. I lost my cheat sheet. Damn it. Okay. Um, let me see. I have an easy way to figure this out. I was going to Google Wayward Sisters and yeah. that'll help me figure out. Hold on, Bria Buckma Brianna Buckmaster, Kim Rhodes, Ruth right. Funnel, yeah. and Samantha Samantha Smith uh, were the ladies, and they were hilarious and entertaining and great. Uh, and then there was um, another uh, panel with the the men folk, uh, including Adam Fergus, uh, David Hayden Jones, DJ Qualls, um, and uh, and then of course um, we went and grabbed some delicious lunch, like you do. And then we saw Misha Collins. Cochon. So, sorry, I got to say a French thing. Cochon. Cochon. So got some mufaladas like you do in New Orleans. They're excellent. Then went back and saw Misha Collins speak. And then we went and took a bunch of pictures with Baby, uh, which we have shared on our Instagram, if you would like to see those. And it was awesome. And um, yeah, and then... Uh, we took ourselves out for uh, oysters and French 75s, like you do. And mm -hmm. then uh, we went to the Boutique du Vampire in the Oddities store. Mm. AKA Liz's credit card hurts. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, I, we found the most amazing uh, uh, Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, who mm -hmm. we've named Edgar and Francine. And mm -hmm. they had a lovely time because we took them to a speakeasy afterwards. A vampire speakeasy. <gasps> I know. All right. We're not going to tell you what the vampire speakeasy is. If, if you're spooky, you'll know. You'll know. You'll find it. And it was super cool. And then we went from there to um, uh, Effervescence because we fancy and had... Uh, 
lovely, lovely amount of bubbles and French fries topped, excuse me, pommes frites topped with a mountain of truffle. And Liz had like the a best legit, of- like, a, like a legit mountain of truffle. Mm-hmm. It was like, I had so much truffle on my boobs and I was like, <laughs> I don't, like, I feel like there's 20 bucks just sitting on my cleavage. Like, and- like decadence on decadence. <laughs> And then you had a delicious uh, dessert, that chocolate, um, was, it, was it a panna cotta or whatever? I don't remember this time. I'm like, whatever. At that yeah. point, I was drunk. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> then we went, then because we, went. we were also, okay, we were drinking bubbles, but we were drinking oh, yeah. absinthe in the bubbles. Yeah. Death in the afternoon was our drink yes. for a bit there. And then, uh, and then we went to the punk rock bar and drank a bunch of beer. Yep, like you do. Yeah. So we got all fancy, then we got all dirty. And yeah. yeah. We, and we took over the jukebox like we do. Like we do. And um, then, uh, yeah. Yeah. We made new friends because that's what we do. We get uh, drunk and, and we, we create an entourage of people who follow us around. Yep. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we made new friends and we got really, yeah, my we tolerance took, sucks. We took, we, so took a, we, took a little, we took a little so jaunt to try to go to a goth bar. That <gasps> yeah. Was we unsuccessful. got denied. We, got, we, got, we were denied entry. Not because Liz was drunk for the record. It was because they said that it was sold out even though there was like nobody in there and we were deeply amused. So we t- hopped a- we took a picture in front of the bar that we were not allowed to go into and got in our cabin. Don't you left. know who we are? <laughs> Do you know who I am? Uh, and then uh, ended up at the dungeon to finish off our evening pretty much. We had one our quick stop after that, but uh, met, met, met a dog at the dungeon like you do after we had a, we had a dance, I, I, we had a dance I, party and we met a dog that's, that's i don't remember important. any of that part so okay cool um yeah and then the next day so this was also the the, the really weird thing about this trip and it's just it's a small world so <laughs> when i was getting on my plane from austin to new orleans i hear somebody go like i look over and i see liz and two of my good friends from austin were yeah. on the same plane going out to new orleans and then we get in new orleans and then diana figures out that one of her friends is there our, our friends our friend? friend yeah yeah and who so, we talk about on the show all the time because she owns high Brum distillery yeah. so we ended up on sunday oh uh diana mm-hmm. keep talking because i'm gonna go get my limerick it's in the other room so you oh, tell yes. everybody about so me Yes. Yeah, so um, our good friend, Stephanie, who has high rum, um, aka Ruminate Distilling in um, Dripping Springs, Texas, uh, was there with her her significant other. And we went and grabbed brunch at Sylvain, which had a really good Bloody Mary, which is exactly what we needed at that moment in our lives. And so I got to walk around, have a lovely brunch and then walk around the square with them. Um, and Liz uh, took advantage of one of the wonderful street artists in Jackson Square, who will type a poem for you however she made a special request she wanted a dirty limerick i did of course i'm back hi um so um yeah this guy who smelled a lot wrote a a dirty limerick about me smelling so i'm kind of like uh, on a typewriter on a typewriter so and we we, we, will i can send you the texture diana i have of edgar and the poem so everyone can see it um so the poem was called dry heat I said poem, it's a limerick. All right. So this is dry heat. Was a gal named Liz from Texas who was famous among all of her exes for the scent of her nethers. And while she got pleasure, she had tested all their gag reflexes. Yeah. So smelly poet guy, when I asked for a dirty limerick, basically gave me a limerick that my pussy smells. Cool. It's actually, it's really, it's very clever and I tipped him well. So thank you, fair, dirty poet. Yes. So yeah. And then, and then it was time to go home. No, you, you, we came, we flew home. So yeah. So that's been that excitement. And in, in the time since then, we've had uh, Thanksgiving and I got a cold and I got tattooed. Well, not, I got tattooed and then I got a cold. That would be rude. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's about all we're up to, right? Is that what we call it? I mean, there was, there was Thanksgiving in there too. So yeah, there was a Thanksgiving (laughs) holiday in there. So that's why we didn't, we didn't put a show out. We figured y'all would, you know. 
Yeah, I'll be busy with their families. And honestly, I was just, I'm fucking exhausted from life. And so uh, eventually, you know, we'll get back over. We'll we'll blame it on the holiday. That's why we were were just, we were giving everybody their space for their thing, to be thankful for things. Yeah, I ate a a very large pie and then therefore couldn't do anything for a week. Uh, It was a delicious (laughs) pie though. It was chocolate cream. It was so good. Uh, But then like the the crust on it was really thick. So I just kind of ate the middle. So by the time it was done, it was just like, like like a whole pie crust. I you did. had the pie crust left over. There's like another pie in it. I should have just like putting like just catch her using the crust and putting more pie in it. <sighs> oh, uh, oh yeah. So that's that. Yeah. And then you know, I have been just watching absurd amount of television and movies, but on this kick where I decided I wanted to watch ridiculous uh Dwayne Johnson movies. So I've watched a lot of movies with The Rock. Um, and things like I've never seen, like I never saw the Jumanjis. So yeah, I watched either. the Jumanjis and they were, they were good. delightful. They were delightful, especially the second one. And I'm like, why did nobody ever tell me this movie was so delightful? Um, and then last night, uh, while I was finishing up research, decided that I needed a some brain cleansing because we get to um, what lore or whatever we're going to call it this week is. Uh, I had things got dark and I was like, I just need something on. And I went to discovery plus and found they have a new crafting competition show, but they're yeah. so fucking serious. Like it is like, there's so much crying over soap. I have never seen so many, like, and this is why like I make soap because my, you know, mother beat me as a child or like whatever reason, but it was just like so many nice. feelings and they keep using soap as a verb. And so they're like, yeah, like, and they call themselves soapers so the first episode's all no. soap and they're like yeah and we're soapers and we're soaping and then they have all these different like phrases like they had like that went with the soaps and it was very very i mean i don't know how stuff. i feel about any of this you have to watch it <laughs> like it's just like you just have like it was so like once i started catching on to the soaping thing that it just like went bonkers like okay so this is what happens on the show and then the second episode is all about candles and diana's a candle maker so you should watch it there's some technical stuff in there but dear god like oh, i vomited so much watching those they're like this is my sea candle and i'm using all these seashells because this is like where my i'm like huh, like what the fuck like who still makes things with seashells and like no no and yeah. then like one girl came up and she was like this is my broken heart and i'm like fuck yeah that's what you do you do the broken heart and then she was like this is my happy rainbow and i'm like why didn't you ruin it you had a broken heart with a sword stabbed through it they're like that was all you need to do you don't need to have like the happy rainbow shit afterwards like i would have given you the prize like uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So I've also figured, like, I was like, yeah, the show would be made for talk soup. And I'm like, realize, like, we, that there's a hole that needs to be filled. And somebody, if you, yeah. yeah, somebody come fill this hole that's felt so dirty. Fill the hole of talk <laughs> soup. I was, I was going to let it slide. No, you can't. I couldn't. No. Okay, good. I'm glad. <laughs> oh, um, oh, yeah. So what are, you, what are you drinking? Um, so I am drinking a hot toddy because I'm on the end of my cold and that's my excuse for drinking a hot toddy. Yeah. How about you? I am drinking a Bordeaux. La Haute de la Garde. I have no idea. That's what you said. I don't know. It's some shitty organic Bordeaux, but it's, it's not shitty. It's delightful, but it's like a $15 bottle of, of wine. So that's where I'm at today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm on call. Like I, you know, this is my last week as an incident commander on call for those of you who know me, that's very exciting. Uh, but it also means it's my last week of being very stressed out of, is this going to go? Am I going to have a new customer? Like did Russia hack somebody in I'm not going to jinx it, but so yeah, I'm really haven't been drinking or anything. So yeah, hopefully I'm not going to get shit faced off this glass of wine. Uh, um, yeah, so that's it. So let's yeah. jump into fresh blood or yes, season three, we, episode seven. 
episode seven, or as we're going to change the name to you, Gordon sucks. And I think that actually is very funny and appropriate given, yeah. you know, what happens. So yeah. Gordon sucks is the name Gordon of this sucks. episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was first aired November 15th, 2007. So you would have been watching it right when you were doing your turkey time like us. Um, this was directed by Kib Manners and was written by Sarah Gamble. Uh, so we've got that and we're going to just just go right into this. And we're going to start off with one of my favorite people, Bella, and then, oh, no. Fucking Gordon. Uh, Fucking Gordon. Gordon shows up at uh, Bella when she's in her Mercedes, walking to her Mercedes. And he's basically stolen her gun and he wants to know where the brothers are. And she's like, oh, I thought you were in prison. Um, and she's like, she basically said she does cover for them at first. She's like, I don't know where they are. And he, you know, Gordon's going off on his whole thing about how he's convinced that Sam's the Antichrist. And uh, and she she mocks him a little bit with like, oh, I heard that something about that from the Easter Bunny. <laughs> Who heard it from the, the Tooth Fairy? So Gordon's not amused and uh, is pointing a gun at Bella. So she said that she doesn't respond to threats, but she'll make a deal. And so he offers her money uh, and uh, to find out where the where the boys are. He offers her three grand. She said, I don't get out of bed for three grand. Um, but then she sees his little, his mojo bag. And she says that would make them even. At first he's like, no, and it's old and priceless. But then again, he's willing to part with it for the Winchester. So he throws it to her. She calls Dean and asks where they are. And Dean answers the phone. And as you can guess what's going to happen with the episode, he tells her where they are. So we cut to our brothers. Sam and Dean are shockingly by a dark building. Um, yeah, with- I know. They found another industrial park. I know. I'm like, oh, shocking. They found an industrial park to shoot an episode in. Um, and they find this guy bleeding and ask this guy, this guy bleeding on the ground. He's not dead, though. And they're like, oh, where is she? And... Um, and he like kind of points. So Dean goes off looking around and um, and then kind of stops in a room and he cuts his arm to use blood to draw the person out. So with a machete, uh, with a machete for the we need a giant machete. And granted, at least it looks clean, but still, like I really hope these boys have their tetanus shots. Like you're gonna so. get locked jaw. Like can you keep cutting yourself with like random metal shit? Like yeah. you're gonna end up with an infection. It's just gonna happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even if you don't get tetanus, I mean, there's so many like service infections you could easily get. Uh, but so obviously they're after a vampire that kind of solidifies it. You know, we saw someone bleeding on the ground, but then also now with him using blood to draw them out, it's like, okay, they're after vampires. So you see this blonde vampire kind of panting and she attacks him and uh, he almost gets fucking bit. This was very risky. Um, and he injects her with. So at, at this point, you're not screaming because I have in all caps in my notes. Oh my God, it's fucking harmony. Yeah. I do. It's <laughs> Harmony. Harmony uh, Kendall from Angel and Buffy uh, is played by Mercedes McNabb, who is our first vampire. Her name is Lucy. Yeah. So, she's actually also, she's actually also has some small roles in the Adams Family movies. She does. Yeah, she is the original Girl Scout. She mm-hmm. is the one. So during they're not small roles. Oh my no, God! How dare you Excuse say me. that Mercedes I, she's McNabb's not, roles? She's not small. the part. She's not part of the family. She, she does gets have roles. tied to a stake and yes. set on fire, and it's yes. satisfying as fuck. Like yeah. oh, I, I, it's I watched so good. that this weekend. Too. Yeah, and the other one is she's the original one is like, would you like to buy some Girl Scout cookies? And then we say Girl Girl Scouts, yes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I love Harmony. I love Mercedes McNabb. Uh, She got into this because she was friends with uh, one of the producers. I don't know it was Eric or what. I think it may have been Eric. Um, But was basically just was kind of like wasn't sure she wanted to do another vampire role. And then she saw this and she was like, oh no, this is really good. So she took it anyways. Uh, So. I'm glad she said yes. So I get to, we get to see many other sides of Harmony. And, you know, I'm just going to shame you again because you still haven't watched Angel. So I've watched part, I know I've watched like the first season or so. You've got to get past the first season. You got to get to where it's really, really good. And when Harmony comes back, like pretty much like when Harmony is there, like things are so good. So good. Anyways, okay. So we've got Harmony jumping on Dean and he stabs her with a syringe. Yeah. And Sam calls Dean out for cutting it so close, which he really did. Like it was a close call. So uh, we cut to her being tied to a chair 
And Sam's asking her questions like, where's your nest? And she's like, I have no idea what's going on. And Dean's threatening to inject her with more dead man's blood. And we kind of figure out that she doesn't know she's a vampire. She thinks she's just real fucking high, which is very distressing, by the way. I'm like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. This is dark. So basically, her story is that her name is Lucy and that um, she went to this club spider um, and said that there was some older person, like 30. 30. This bitch. <laughs> Uh, buying her drinks and um, uh, they're like Deacon or Dixon at this point. And then so, but basically he's a dealer and he says he has something new for her and drops something in her brain, in her drink. And they're like, oh, was it red and thick? Like maybe like blood. And she's like, I think it was roofies. And we, ended, I was at his place and I got hungry and I broke out. So basically he's like dosing chicks at the bar with vampire blood. Yeah, which is shitty. Uh, yeah. But also, I've been to a, lot, a number of vampire clubs, and I'm sure, like, like, oh yeah, drink this blood, it'll be fine. But one, her name is Lucy, so yeah. you Bram Stoker Dracula, we've got Lucy, right? Yeah. So we got that in there. She is somehow making this cami situation work. I don't know, like, how she's like. I wish I could pull that off, and she just does. Like, yeah. I have so yeah. many. Like, I buy camis like that all the time, and like, hers is like covered in like dry blood and whatever, and it still looks good. Fuck you, Harmony. Like, what? How dare you? And also, I never refer to her to Lucy in any of my notes. It's just Harmony. Um, yeah. So Dean is basically telling her that you know you've got a dose of the worst virus out there with yeah. so much compassion in his voice and i'm like what the fuck is up with you dean like i think they treat her so bad like i'm very offended for her and once they once they realize that she has no fucking idea like she full-on thinks she's hallucinating she doesn't think anything of any of this is actually happening she thinks she's just real fucking high and can't come down and they're still being kind of shitty to her and i mean like i get like uh okay she's a vampire and you can't really unvamp her but at the same time like she didn't choose this. She wasn't like attacked like a victim. Like, I mean, yeah, she might like to party too much, but goddamn. You're going to treat Sam like, like an asshole because his mom dripped demon blood into his mouth. You're going to treat <laughs> Dean like an asshole because he voluntarily chose to like make a deal with the demon. Like, no, you guys aren't doing that. You're just doing this to this chick. So yeah. I don't know if you're just working out your feelings on her, but it's not cool. Dean. It's mm. not cool. So, uh, yeah. And so basically, though, but they're like, yeah, you, your light's too bright. Your, your sun burned your skin and you killed two, almost three people. And she's like, no, I just want, just help me. She's like begging for help. And Sam, you can tell feels bad for her, but Dean's like, no, you know, we don't have a choice. So, so he cuts her he head just off. He just cuts, off, cuts her head off and that's, Harmony is done. Harmony's Hi, Harmony. Done. At least you have that cami to wear to your grave. He looks really good in it. So we're gonna flash to a hospital room, and oh shit! Now it's not just Gordon. Now we got fucking Kubrick here too. Oh, oh, oh fuck! I it. forgot. I forgot his name for a minute, and I just called him Creeper. I call him asshole Jesus guy until I looked up his name. So I, either way it works. I mean, sure. Yeah. So they they're talking to the guy that was almost killed by Harmony slash Lucy, and um, he describes her the attacker as having like PCP strength. It's kind of funny. So, and then, but Gordon's really, really concerned asking if she bled on him. And he's very confused by that statement. But as you would be. Yeah. yeah. But then, you know, I honestly think their explanation makes sense. Like, right, you know, like from a, a clinical thing, yeah. like it's a bloodborne pathogen. You've got to mm -hmm. actually ingest it. Like she can bite you and the saliva isn't going to do it. It actually has to be, you know, from the blood. So that actually cover there. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So and then um and then he he tells uh, Gordon and Kubrick that she jumped on me and bit me, and then two guys chased her down the alley. One of them was tall. So now, of course, Gordon and Kubrick know for sure that uh, the Winchester brothers are there. So we see the brothers leaving a bar, potentially the spider, where this was happening. And Sam's just convinced they're on a hunting ground at this point. Uh, and around the corner, they see this guy walk off with like some chick, like walking around the alley, like all. Well, it's also you do see the spider side like oh did you i missed the spider side yeah it's actually a pretty cool side it's like a red neon and they have like a little black widow going down uh mm. during the way i saw the red neon i saw the red neon i missed it yeah. my bad but yeah so they're 
you know, so she, so they're like, all right, we need to go follow this because obviously this guy is going to dose this chick now. And right when he's about to dose her, he's like, he's the guy says one hit of this and you'll never be the same. Accurate, creepy, but accurate. And, um, the brothers show up, so she gets away and, um, but the vampire does also, and the brothers run around the corner and straight into Gordon and Kubrick, who start just fucking shooting. They just open fucking fire. Yeah, this is like, they just start hammering them with bullets. They like, just... So, so anyways, I started blasting. Anyway, um, so Dean tells Sam to run and he'll draw them off. And Sam's not happy about this, obviously, because they've got their, you know, Dean's got his, you know, tragic death wish now. Um, and then... Um, a vampire the vampire that they had been cha- that they chased off drops down and just kicks the fucking shit out of gordon so satisfying yeah so yeah and so we got sam super worried at the motel and then dean walks in so it makes a joke about getting stopping for pizza and being a badass of course because you know can't admit that he's being irresponsible um at all ever so um, Sam really wants to know how how they were found. And Dean realizes then that it was fucking Bella. He calls, says that bitch and pulls out his phone. And she's like, yeah, she 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 tells him that she sold them out. She blamed it on Gordon having the gun on her. She meant to call them and warn them, but got sidetracked and didn't realize it was a big deal because there's only one of him of two of them. But there, it's not. It's two and two. And he said, Dean tells Bella, if they make this out of this alive, he's going to kill her. And he sounds real fucking serious. So much so that she actually looks concerned. And she's never really looked concerned when he's been after her before. Yep. So. No, his yeah. attitude is just really, really bad at this point. It is like, no, I, I would be concerned too. I'd be like, yeah. oh, shit. Okay. No, nope, nope, he's going to kill me. Um, yeah. yeah um, oh, what did and, I do? And, and kind of like. I mean, he's kind of right here. She fucking sold them out for realties. Now, I know that she had the gun on her, too. Like, I don't know what she would have done, but at least she could have fucking warned them not been too distracted to fucking bother. Like, come on, bitch. Yeah. So uh, now we cut to back to an industrial park and Gordon is tied to a bed frame. And uh, there's also two blonde chicks strung up by their wrists that are tied up. Uh, who appear to be vampires and the um, uh, uh, Dixon is feeding them blood. Is it Dixon? Crap. I forgot. I, I, just, I just have him as vampire. Vampire so is feeding, feeding them blood and calling them his family and talks about how he's a, they're his type are a dying breed. And he knows who Gordon is and blames him for being responsible for vampires being close to extinction. Yep. And then we get some lovely more Gordon shit. So Gordon says, oh, they're not your family. They're fang whores. And then Mm -hmm. he just spews a bunch of nonsense. And I fucking hate him. Um, Mm -hmm. But then, then things get good. Because the vampire gives Gordon blood. Suck it, Gordon. Yeah, like literally. Suck it. He is pissed. So yeah, this guy, this guy's like, Dixon's like, fuck you, Gordon, you're a piece of shit. You won't, you hate us so fucking much. You're going to be one of us and does that to him. So Gordon is now a vampire, which is both very poetic and also really probably bad. Just saying. Yes, it's good and bad. Uh, and then, you know, Sarah, when she was talking about, so Sarah actually wrote the first episode that Gordon was in and then also the last episode. So she actually got to see his character from start to finish. Oh. So you get this arc, which is, as we'll, we'll go through the rest of this episode, but I mean, it is like, you know, that interesting thing that someone who saw things in such black and white yeah. now is like being shoved, like, oh, you don't have a choice. You're going to see this other side. Yeah. And we're going to see what you do with it. It's not good. What you do no. with it's not good, Gordon. You you you, you missed the message again. You yes. St- you still missed it. Yep. So the brothers agree that they're, they just need to kill Gordon. And Dean's just surprised that Sam agrees. And, and it is a little surprising, but also not. I mean, obviously at this point, there's no fucking change in Gordon's mind, right? They're not going to talk him out of killing Sam. He is dead fucking focused on that mission. So Bella, while they're, while they're there and they're discussing this, Bella calls and she said she's found Gordon's location and her, basically she doesn't like grudges and she doesn't want to be killed. So I'm going to help out you guys as much as possible in undoing this clusterfuck that I contributed to. 
So, uh, and she relays a message from this, from the spirit world to leave town and don't go after Gordon. I also love this is like, this is the most convenient way to track people ever. Like you don't need to find my phone or, you know, just like, no, I'm just going to hit my Ouija board and be like, Hey, where are they at? (laughs) Hey Hey, spirits, where they be. (laughs) All right. Um, so we cut back to the industrial park, of course, where the fucking uh, vampire's at. And Gordon is now strung up like the blondes uh, with his little his little wrist tied up. And he's developing his vampy, vampy senses and everything's coming into focus. Um, but apparently he's like way stronger than other vampires because he just pulls the fucking chain out of the goddamn ceiling and leaves. Well, makes a bunch of noise, looks at the girls, and then they cut away. Uh, yeah. So, uh, he leaves the, the, he leaves, leaves the, the vampire den, if you will. And here he goes out to the street and he sees some guy changing a tire. And at first he seems like he's trying to resist the urge to go eat this guy, but he eventually gives in and, um, you see him, his fangs come out and he eats the guy when that guy's he sucks. changing his tire. Yeah, he sucks. And then Gordon just sucks away. And we're going to go back to another van, indus- back to, I said, back at industrial place. So back at the dungeon, whatever the fuck the vampire was living at. And there are vampires very upset because our blondes have been beheaded. Yes. So Gordon, even though he is a vampire now, he beheaded the two blonde vampires also. And, um, and and the brothers are there now, and he, and and Dixon, the the main vamp, he's just he's like like bawling. He's on his knees, and he's like, "Look, just go ahead and kill me. I just I I just want revenge on Gordon, but I'm I'm done. This is desperation. I've lost everyone I've ever loved, and I don't want to spend my attorney alone. This is hell. It's actually kind of sad. It is yeah. No, I mean he basically has lost all his family, I and mean, they're not good. They're not good vampires. They're not you know, but. Yeah. yeah, he's been going through months of shit, and then he Gordon rips the set, the heads off his new children, which you know he also you know there, there's a lot of problems in this. You know he there's basically a lot of problems in this. He, so went, all, he like kidnapped and drugged them, and yeah. yeah, and chained them up. It's it's real weird. Um, but he basically stopped giving a damn. It's like being dead already. So basically, he's this is a sociopath vampire who is very depressed and has lost his shit. Yep. Yep. But so. But this is, you know, the fact that their heads have been ripped off is what tips Instead Sam of cut off. off. Yes. Yeah. And Sam's like, oh, oh no, oh. that's oh, no. that shit. Gordon's a vampire. Oh no. Ah, no. <laughs> oh, fuck. So we go to the Jesus trailer. <laughs> I go to <the> Jesus RV. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the jesus mobile um, the jesus, rather jesus mobile and um kubrick's there and gordon's there and kubrick asks if gordon's okay uh so gordon tells him that he was turned and that um no you know and gordon knows that kubrick has to kill him but not until gordon kills sam because he thinks because i'm stronger and faster now I can do this. I have to be able to do this. And um, so you can't kill me until after I kill Sam. Then we, then I'm, I'm ready to die. It's my last good thing I'm going to do. Jesus fucking Christ, Gordon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some self-righteous shit there. Uh, well, Kubrick uh, is like, oh, uh-huh, sure, 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 man. Sure. But about to stab him because he's like, nope, you're a vampire. I'm killing your ass. And then Gordon kills him first by like punching his hand straight through his chest. Yep. Oh, at least he's dead. All right, cool. So, so Kubrick, Kubrick did. Kubrick did. But it also seems like a waste because at this point, if Gordon's a vampire, he didn't drink his blood. Like, come on. I think I'm he's full. Saying. He's from full, the man. from the from the car. The guy changing the tire. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. And really, right. do you think Kubrick tastes good? He doesn't. He just he tastes like sour, sour something. Like you know, <sighs> it's not good. <sighs> Yeah. So we're going to go back to the guys at, is it a motel or a squat? Like I really couldn't tell because they had everything like put up. They, there was a lot of mattresses for it being a motel room, but I kind of think it was, but they had the mat- mattresses like up against the windows. Um, they're trying to, I guess, stack and protect from Gordon trying to get into their room. I think it was a weird ass motel room with two beds in it and they had both mattresses and box springs up. That's my theory. Yeah, no, I mean, because it kind of looks motel y. Yeah. And I was like, but the, it was just the mattresses that made it look as well. Yeah. So, anyway, Agreed. so we're there. The guys are there. And, and, and then their phones get smashed. Yeah. Sam smashes their phones because he doesn't want 
Gordon to be able to figure out their numbers and their cell signals. And um, Dean really wants to go out alone again, looking for Gordon. And Sam's like, uh, no, this is a terrible idea. You're going to get yourself killed. And Dean's like, just another day at the office. A massively dangerous day at the office. <sighs> so Sam calls him out again about taking too many risks and acting like he's already dead. Calls him a kamikaze. And Dean says, no, I'm a ninja. And Sam is not amused. Yeah, but I actually think in, for this time, I think maybe it's because we finally get a reaction at the end that I don't hate this fight as much as yeah. I've hated the previous ones. Because Sam is really fun. I mean, like, look, this is when you were scared, this is what you do. And mm-hmm. so to me, it's like, no, that actually is. And, and granted, you know, it's something we, yeah. we know about him, but I think it's a good insight into the character, right? And so Dean does seem to acquiesce to this. And so um so he says they'll cover their sins and then sam is burning a sage bundle in a bowl because mm. uh, i don't know i don't know is that supposed to cleanse their phone signals i don't Get know i have no idea why yeah uh yeah so yeah, if i can keep the nsa off of me by burning some sage that'd be great. right <laughs> So, um, but this this little like argument kind of ends with Sam saying, like, I wish he would drop the show and be my brother. Oh. So they agree to wait out uh, in a motel room together and they're just like fortifying the room. And I think my comment about that, by the way, was that Sam burned some weird shit. <laughs> so, but then apparently Dean's got his burner phone and it rings and he's only had it for two hours. And guess who the fucking is? Gordon. Gordon is apparently very resourceful. Because Dean smells and he left a scent all over the cell phone store. Ew. Um, is that a theme of this episode? Just yeah, smelling. Our, our episode, not, not the TV show episode. <laughs> um, so call, Gordon's like, look, you got to come to me. I have a hostage and that's it. And Dean's like, don't do this. You don't kill innocent people. You're a hunter. And Gordon answers, no, I'm a monster. So he's like bridging between the two vampire versus just being set on his mission still. So basically he doesn't identify as a hunter anymore except for to kill Sam. Yeah. Which is a kind of a big, big character change for Gordon, I would say. Maybe. I mean, I was just like, oh, I'm going to be shitty here now. Like I was shitty over here and I'm going to be shitty this way. Uh, So we're going to get back to industrial land. Yeah, back to the industrial park, like we do. And they, they, you know, they're they're going to him and they find the hostage and untie her. Um, And then a garage, as they're trying to escape, some garage door drops, perfect timing, and it separates them from each other. And Dean's with the hostage. I know, Dean's with the hostage and Sam's all alone and the lights shut off. And you know, it's pitch black and Sam can't see, but Gordon can, because he's got his vampire sight and he's going to chase him around in the dark. It was kind of cool. They had like this weird red night vision that was supposed to be uh, Gordon's point of view. Yeah, it was like vampire see red in the dark. Neat. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then we and, get more Gordon monologuing. Oh, and, a long yeah. monologue about how he sacrificed everything to kill the most dangerous thing I've ever hunted. I'm like you're not human. Blah blah blah. Just die already, Gordon. Just fucking die. That is yeah. all my notes say from you know from here on out. Just just yeah. fucking what, what do you? <laughs> Yeah, Sam Sam calls him out though, and he tells Sam Gordon tells Sam you're not human, and Sam says neither are you. <laughs> Facts. Yeah. Facts. Um, and then um yeah. And then we realize that, you know, Sam points out, like, look, you didn't kill that hostage, so maybe you're not a total monster. But then it dawns on them, on dawns on him and the audience at this point that the hostage is not just a girl she's been turned oh no oh no so right as dean's trying to get to sam and get through that crazy doorway that separated them she turns into a vampire and attacks him but he shoots her in the head with a cult with a cult and so we get some fun um electrical 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 flicker anything but then we get more gordon monologue uh, I don't even know. Uh, I, I didn't even write down. I mean, he really more. does. I, he he really does fit like that. The trope of the um, you know, the super villains who really like to talk about themselves. He really truly does. Yep. And then finally, whatever. Like I really don't give a shit what he says. And they finally fight. Woohoo! So they're fighting. Gordon bites Dean, and then Sam. Well, Sam solves the shit <laughs> by taking a Holy razor. Fuck. <laughs> that is it. That this seems fucking. Into, this part's intense. 
It he is. has a razor wire wrapped around Gordon's neck, looped around it. And it just keeps pulling and pulling and pulling until the razor wire beheads him. Yeah. And so he finally, Gordon's dead. Woohoo! Yeah. Dance a little dance on his head. Like I really kicked it. I would have used it as a soccer ball. Whew. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to take a pause and, and, and think about this, right? So Gordon is dead. And we're gonna play a game. Oh, so we could have a lore sound in here. I don't know if you want to. We could, whatever. It's it's not really lore. It's sort of lore. But we're gonna play a game called Which Gordon is Worse. Oh, okay. So originally, you know, Diana, like we were going to talk about the casket girls today and yeah. we're, we still are talking about them. We'll talk about them one day. One day I'll tell you all the history about our casket girls and learn about them at some point. Uh, but I was just really in a, in a bad place after watching this and I was very angry at Gordon and the fact that he existed. And so I was like, you know what? I bet there are a lot of crazy people named Gordon. And you know what? There are. Uh, I mean, we've got, you know, the Gordon Cummings, the Blackout Ripper. We got Gordon Ramsay, the Gordon Fisherman. I mean, we've got like all of those people. But we're going to stick to with one for today's game. All right. So we're going to go with which Gordon is worse, Gordon Walker or Gordon Stewart Northcott. Do you want to do you want to take a guess like right off the bat which one do you think is going to be worse? Do you want to hedge something? I mean, I don't know. Like this one's pretty bad. So this other one has to be real. The other Gordon has to be real fucking bad. So I'm going to bet it's him. Okay. All right. So we're going to start off with this this is a story of the Wineville Chicken Co-op murders. Oh, wait, and that's Coop. Whitefield Chicken Coop murder. Sorry, that's Chicken Coop, not Chicken Co-op. They, they well, like, Co-op's a they, thing, too. So the anyway. Co-op's a thing, too. But, and it just finally dawned on me that says Chicken Coop, and I've been thinking it was Co-op for the last two days. But anyway, okay, so we are traveling back to California, March 10th, 1928, and we're going to meet Christine Collins. Christine Collins is a, is a typical mom at this time. And I think she may be single because we don't, I don't hear about her husband being mentioned, uh, but she gives her nine-year-old son, son, Walter money to go to the movies. Like you do, it's 1928. It's like, here's an, here's a, here's a nickel, Walter, go, go, go catch the talkies. Uh, I don't know if there were talkies at this point, but so she gives him money for the movies and he just never comes home. And it's really sad. And they, uh, sorry, the cat just jumped on the back of the chair <laughs> and Diana is laughing again because, mm-hmm. yep, that's happening. Okay, and so she basically goes to the police. She's like, my son's been kidnapped. And it becomes this huge thing in LA at the time because um, a girl had just been kidnapped and found dismembered. Um, and somebody says the public is like, oh shit, we got another kid missing. Like, we need to find it. So all, it, all and it becomes like a nationwide thing. So everybody is searching for Walter and they they just don't find. Him. So five months go by and there's a boy that appears in the Cobb, Illinois. And he is like, I Walter, you found me. And he's like, yay, Walter's here. Um, so he Christine pays for him to go from Illinois to California. And but the boy who arrives, although he looks like him, so it's just like that's not my kid. But Captain J.J. Jones of the LAPD was like, that's your kid. And she's like, no, no, sir, it is not. And he was like, you are a hysterical female. He just looks different because he's been away for a few months. So why don't you take him home for a few weeks and try him out? <laughs> but he tells her to try out this child. And so just try him out. You try it out. Like, you know, you'll figure it out. It's your kid, right? Like, so she, like, she's finally, she's like, I guess I take this kid home. So after three weeks, like, she is, like, at this point, she is enlisted help of, like, people who, like, do, like, dental forensics. I don't like dental forensics, just dentists. And they're like, Walter's mouth had a lot of fillings. This child has not had any dental work done. And she goes to the police and she is like, this is not my kid. He doesn't have any fillings in his teeth. And the, the police are like, ma'am, 
you're just trying to embarrass us at this point. And you are an unfit mother and you are a terrible woman. And because you are like this, we're locking you up in the psychiatric ward. So they take Christine Collins and they put her in the psychiatric ward of LA County in general under code 12, which is a code to commit someone who is deemed difficult or an inconvenience. Oh, fuck. Is that still a code? Can I make a list? There actually was a reform that came after this that, you know, we're, um, I think I kept trying to find that the president, I, I saw so, somewhere that they changed how you would commit people after this, but that's probably a good idea. Cause I mean, uh, if, if that if difficult or inconvenient was <laughs> cause to commit people, there'd be a lot of people committed right now. We would save so much time. I wouldn't have to watch things at the airport about how you should be an adult and not get really drunk and hammer on flight attendants. Yeah, anyways. What? You're crazy. People people don't, like, people need to be told that? They do, apparently, many times, and, and by so animated insane. characters. So All insane. Right. So she is kept in this hospital, and the, the number of days are kind of, like, I've seen anywhere from five to ten, but she's at least there for a number of days. Where At least those they, are the days she didn't have to take care of this strange-ass kid. Right. And, well, except they're treating her really bad, uh, yeah. inhumanely, because it's a psych ward, and they're giving her all sorts of different, med- like, different kinds of medicine to try and bring her back to her senses and admit mm-hmm. this is her child. Um, so while she's locked up, though, uh, the child finally admits my name is Arthur, and I am not her her son. Um, I was just basically I, I didn't like my parents. I ran away from home, and when I was somebody told me I look like this kid, so I decided to just be him. It's like actually kind of smart though and creepy for a kid though, right? Yes, yeah, so a demented child. There's things that happen with Arthur, but whatever. Uh, fuck Arthur. I don't care. Like he's, but so they finally let her out of the psych ward and she basically sues them. And she was like, what the fuck are you doing to me? Yeah. And so the actual captain was ordered to pay $10,800 to her, which is about a hundred grand now. Um, and she was going to use this money to search for her son and he never pays her. So he never pays her money. She brings him in and out of court, like over the next few years. And yeah. be like, Bit, bitch, better have my money. And he just still never pays her. Uh, so, but at this point, after she's gone, the police finally turn up a lead. And that leads us, brings us to this shitty Gordon. Um, Gordon hmm. Stewart Northcott. All right, so the Northcott story. So in they're originally from Canada. Uh, in 1924, the... Uh, the Norcots moved to LA and with them, they bring their teenage son, Gordon. There, I think there was also a daughter in there too, but whatever. And so, and some people say, you know, he was spoiled or just basically his mother had a very unhealthy obsession with him. So, you know, they've, they've been in LA for about a year. It's 1925. Mm-hmm. And so Stuart, this is what we're calling, we're not calling Gordon, called Stuart for a moment. Um, he's 19 and he befriends a 10 year old child, you know, like healthy 19 mm-hmm. year olds do and then he tries to molest a child and so oh yeah trigger warning trigger warning we're about things are about to get real bad uh talks uh, tales of childhood abuse uh brutality and murder are coming so there's your trigger warning sorry i didn't say it earlier um so okay so the kid goes to the police and the police are like, well, what's happening? And then they got Gordon's mom or Stuart's mom is like, no, my son would never do anything like this. Why would you believe this lying 10 year old? And they're like, well, I guess like you guys are right and nothing happened. Um, but the whole thing they also didn't tell the police was that they had moved to LA because this shit happened where they were before. So they had moved there oh. to cover up like what, what he was doing. So so now we're here um and it's now it's 1926 and Stuart's like hey mom you know what i really want i want a farm i want a farm i want to live in the country and really he wants to live in the country so he can fuck with children and nobody will know and his parents being the outstanding citizens they are go you know i bet if he's in the country we're not going to have police knocking on our door Hmm. So I'm a chicken ranch. So they buy him a chicken ranch in Wineville, California. 
Hmm. And so chicken ranching apparently is very hard. And Stuart doesn't want to uh, pay for anybody to help him. So he has his sister's 13-year-old son, Sanford Clark, come down from Canada to help out and immediately starts abusing him. And like, just it's all very horrific what happens to Sanford, but he's being physically and sexually abused. Um, He's only allowed to work on the farm. And this is also 1928. Six, so there's no telephone at the farm, so you can't call anybody. He is writing letters to his sister and his mom, who are up in Canada still. And but Stuart is watching him every time he writes these letters, so everything, big, yeah. yeah. But the letters are starting to sound really weird because the mom, and the sisters, are like, "Hey, this doesn't really sound like him. Like something, something is going on." Yeah. Uh, so. Eventually, um, and eventually Stanford actually basically developed Stockholm syndrome because he's not allowed to go anywhere. And so he right. basically is getting you know, beaten to submission by, by Stewart. Uh, but at this point, Stewart decides that Stanford's just not enough for him. So he starts roaming all over California looking for abandoned children and also migrant children, because a lot of people, especially those in Mexico, were sending their kids up to California to work the fields because it wasn't considered that unsafe at this time because... There wasn't television to tell us people, you know, about people like like Gordon right. Stewart. We, yeah, yeah. Like this is science. So he is basically picking up children on the side of the road, and he takes them to the farm. He keeps them for days, abuses them, and then drops them off on the side of a road. And but usually they're you know they're little boys, and this is you know, one obviously please don't listen to them um yeah. to uh they're just embarrassed by what happens which is something that's very often happens with male uh, male victims of sexual abuse yeah. so um so a lot of you don't they don't even know that is going on and so sanford is there remember sanford's like 13 he's probably like 14 at this time but so he is witnessing everything that's happening and whenever there isn't a kid there he gets you know the brunt of the abuse uh, right so t- this is going on this ranch. S- S- Sanford's getting fucked in the head in other places. Sorry, that was awful. But so mm-hmm. in 1928, um, a 15-year-old named Julio Mendez uh, is picked up by by Stewart, and this is all kind of vague. There's a lot of things when they talk about the body that was discovered there of being an unnamed Mexican child, but I found his name as being Julio Mendez. I really hope that is who he is and that can be acknowledged. But so basically Julio stands up to Stuart and was like, nah, dude, I'm not, I'm 15. I'm not gonna fuck you. Like what is wrong with you? And uh, Stuart kills him and he Mm. shoots him and has Sanford help him dispose of the body. And according to an episode of Evil Ken, where they talk about this, uh, at this time, Stuart's getting bolder. And so he's no longer now looking for random people, like random migrant children or other people who can't be identified. Um, He sees Walter Collins walking around Mm -hmm. town on the way to his movies and basically is like, hey, kid, you want to go for a ride in my car? And kidnaps Walter and takes him out to the ranch. And mm. this is a point where Christine reports him missing and it's making the press, but there's nothing that's tying it to the ranch. Um, so five days after Walter has disappeared, Stewart's mom, Louise, has shown up at the farm and she discovers Walter asleep inside a locked shed. She confronts Stewart and then supposedly she bludgeons Walter with an ax to the head. Uh, it is debated whether or not it was mm. her her trying to cover up what Stuart was doing or Stuart actually is the one who killed him and then Louise just covered it up for him but regardless of that horrible fact um Sanford is made to dismember the body alongside of Stuart so basically Stuart is making sure he has a hand in all these crimes so it's fucking with his head more and more and more um as the body has been dismembered and buried. Um, Seward then kidnaps two more boys from town. These are the Winslow brothers, and they were kidnapped from a park. He abused them for six days, then murdered them, again, making Sanford participate in, in the murder. So now we're in July of 1928, and Sanford's sister, sister Jesse, who's 19, she finally shows up at the farm because she is worried about what's going on based on the letters that he sent. And 
after a few days, she kind of she gets to her to tell her some of what's going on, but she knows that she can't alert. Stuart, uh, okay, so Sanford tells her what's going on a little bit, but she doesn't confront Stuart because she didn't basically, they, they know that he would kill her um, and mm. that his mom probably would too. And like, you know, they're just like, so she stays over several weeks and then goes back to Canada and she's a smart little cookie. I like Jesse a lot because she's like, you know what? If I go to the cops, they're not going to do anything. So I'm going to go to immigration. So she goes to immigration and tells them that her brother is illegally in California and they need to deport him. And it's really shitty that I know, like, you know, a hundred years later, literally, I can't believe that was a hundred years ago, but a hundred years later, this is probably the same shit, right? Like, I can call and report you to immigration and people are more likely to take action than if I reported something else. It's really shitty, but also smart, Jesse, smart. Um, so they, uh, police end up going to the ranch. To be, to be fair, it's also easier to prove probably. Maybe. Faster. Yeah, it's true. Faster to prove. Yeah. Yeah. But I think you're going to get action on it. Right. So the police do go out to the chicken ranch, but by this time, um, they were Stuart kind of knew things were going on with uh, the sister. So he and Louise both flee to Canada, leaving Sanford behind. Uh, the LAPD come out to, you know, joyous people that they are. They come out to the Northcott Ranch in Winefield and they find Sanford there and they take him into custody. And after a few days, he tells the police everything. Uh, he does say that three boys are murdered on the farm at this point. So police go out and they start digging and they don't find any complete bodies at the site. But they mm. did discover personal effects of missing children. They also discovered a bloodstained axe and body parts, including bones, hair and fingers from three of the victims that were buried in lime near the chicken house. So. Mm. Sanford tells the police that quick lime is used to dispose of the rain, remains and the rest of the bones have been dumped in the desert. Louise and Stewart are captured and they're arrested near uh, Vernon, British Columbia and then extradited back to the States. Um, so that according to Sanford stories at this time, he says, look, only four boys were held and murdered. Uh, the three LA children who remains were found and eventually who North you know, is, is, um, put on trial for and an unidentified Mexican boy that North cop beheaded and disposed of the body. So this may have been someone who was not Julio Mendez. Mm. I don't know. There's also stories of him running his victims out to wealthy Southern California pedophiles. So that basically, you know, this is what, you know, they were doing at the chicken ranch. Like people would come out there and, and take turns with the boys. Uh, so we, we got, now we're going to trial, right? Uh, Louise takes blame for all the murders in an attempt to save her precious boy. Uh, she basically gets, ends up getting put on trial, though, just for Walter Scott's murder, and she pleads oh. guilty for that. So she pleads guilty to Walter's. And Superior Court Judge Morton sentenced her to life on December 31st, 1928. They didn't want to put her up for execution because she was a woman. She served her sen sentence at a state prison and was paroled after less than 12 years. What? Yeah, life sentence or 12 years, you know, whatever comes first. Uh, so during her sentencing, uh, Louise claimed that her son was innocent and then also went in all these crazy things about that he was an illegitimate son of an English nobleman. Uh, she said that she was Gordon's grandmother and that he was a result of incest between her husband and their daughter. So all sorts of fun shit and she's just spewing out of the child. Wow. And she also says that as a child, Gordon was sexually abused by the entire family. And, you know, frankly, wouldn't be surprised. He turned out to be a fucking piece of shit. Shit happened to this kid. Like, not going to deny that. Was he a son of an English nobleman? Probably not. Was he probably abused by all of his family? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's probably true. Uh, so Sanford Clark was never tried for murder. Uh, thankfully for him, but he was sentenced to five years at the Whittier State School, and his sentence was later commuted to 23 months, and then he went back, he was deported back to Canada, so then Stewart goes to court, and like many dumb serial killers, he discharges his counsel and defends himself. Um, oh, oh, he didn't do a good job. He did yeah. not, no, and he was convicted for the murder of uh, the beheaded child and also the Winston brothers. Uh, while he is incarcer incarcerated at San Quentin, he basically went back and forth between like, I'm innocent or I killed 20 people. Like he just kind of, you know, he never really 
because and basically he was a pathological liar um and he was always like i will show you where more victims are being buried and then he'd always like change his mind at the last moment um mm. the warden of san quentin called him a lurid account of mass murder sodomy oral copulation and torture so vivid it made my flesh creep every time i talked to him so yeah oh. not a cool dude um he was hung on October 12th, 1930, at the age of 23. His final words were, a prayer, please say a prayer for me. And yeah, probably have some for you. But And uh, so that's what happened to him. Uh, our Captain Jones, our police officer, mm -hmm. uh, he got suspended for four months without pay. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. I bet that was very hard on him after he imprisoned a woman. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, other other aftermath of this so wineville changed its name to mira loma on november 1st 1930 because they were tired of being associated with the wineville chicken coop murders so if you ever go to mira loma uh that's actually wineville um i like wineville but you know um and his house is still standing you can actually go see that uh so and the other last thing on the aftermath is you know, despite the evidence uh christine refused to accept that Northcott had murdered Walter. And she you know, tried to reach out to him, you know, over while he was still on trial before he went before um, before he was executed. Yeah. And she was supposed to meet with him on the eve of his execution. And he told her he was going to tell her what happened. And then when she got there, he denied her seeing him and mm. said, I'm innocent. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. Uh, mm. But Christine never gave up on Walter. And she spent the, the rest of her life searching for him until she died. And she was 75, which is very sad. That is. Uh, Holy crap. Yeah, so this has actually had its place within um, a lot of pop culture. Uh, there is a Angelina Jolie film from 2008, Nay the Changeling, which is based mm -hmm. on the story. I've never seen it. I may watch it now. Oh, I heard about it. I remember yeah. hearing about it. It looks real dark. So I don't know yeah, if I want to watch it. I'm like, I'm like, Jumanji or really dark thing about like mm -hmm. child, you know, you getting put in prison. Oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also one of the plot lines of American Horror Story Hotel. Um, and so Miss Miss Evers, a maid of Hotel Cortez, is seen in a flashback having her young son abducted by a man on Halloween. So implying that her son is one of Gordon's victims. So, so that's the story of Gordon Stewart Northcott. So which is worse? It's real hard, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know. I think I think I think Stewart might be worse. Yeah, yeah, no, he is. He is. He's he's definitely, definitely worse. He is definitely worse. Definitely but it doesn't worse. make Gordon any better. It does not make Gordon Walker any better of a man. No, it doesn't, but yeah, yeah. If you gotta choose, it's definitely, definitely the the Wineville chicken coop murders are way worse. Oh. Whee! Yeehaw! Well, thanks for that sunny story, Liz. You're welcome. You're like, I thought I was going to hear about French vampire girls. Uh, <laughs> no, shit. Uh, so, all right. We're going to get uh, back to Gordon's head lying on the ground. Uh, yeah, so Gor Gordon did very aggressively from Sam, and Sam's hands are real bloody. And while, and, and he's very, and you can tell Sam's like pretty shaken up, but like, that's a pretty hands on, a, like, gnarly way to kill someone. And Sa Dean calls Sam reckless now, which is kind of funny because that's been a thing going back and forth. Um, so we cut to our closing scene of this episode. And we see a cooler beer and uh, crazy circles by Bad Company is playing. And we're on the side of the road, which is a very odd place for this to take place. And I will get there in a second. So Dean is under the hood on baby and... Um, you know, Sam hands him a beer and some tools. And um, Dean's like, oh, a car could be out of tune or it could be something else. And I'm just going to say, like, if the car is out of tune, like, unless it's literally not running, you don't stop on the side of the goddamn road to fix that. You, like, find somewhere where you might be have to sit for a minute because it might take a while, not just a cooler beer. Like, not just, like, oh, we're in the woods on the side of the road. Gonna, Maybe they just want a beer. Up. It's just a weird place to stop and do a tune up. I'm I agree. Different. I agree. It's weird. I was, but like, I, I was like, I was like, oh no, something's wrong. I'm like, wait, no, this is, are we just doing some maintenance? The fuck are we doing here? 
<laughs> let's not anyways so but um but it's dean starts pointing out you know how dean's having sam like when and working with him like pointing out the car parts of the engine the valve covers in the carburetor and he wants sam to start working on baby because he needs to know how to do it in the future and he wants to show his little brother the ropes so it's sweet because it's him being a brother right? that part's very was- sweet except for the location it makes no sense <laughs> I was like, I like the ending. Like in motel parking lot would make sense. But a fucking Walmart parking lot would make more sense. Side of the road, not make sense. Yeah, but you can't drink a cooler beer in a Walmart parking lot. I mean, uh, I mean eh? I wouldn't be the first ones. So oh, either way. No, but yeah, no. so that's how the episode wraps. So it's kind of like it kind of comes back to when Sam Mess mentioned earlier in the episode he's like i wish she would drop the show and be my brother and that's just kind of what it is now it's still dean's fatalism about well i'm gonna die so that you're gonna get the you're gonna get baby eventually so you might as well know how to work on her but also oh let's actually do brother shit Tell yeah about. yeah which I, I get more than you know um i have more of you know less of the fatalism and more of the we're going to hang out and do some shit together. And you should probably know how to work on this car. But why have I never, why have I not taught to you this before? Yeah. yeah. So there we go. I still hate the vampire teeth, but I'm glad Gordon's dead. <laughs> and Gordon is dead. Yay! Yep. Woo-hoo. All right. So with that, I think we can close this out. Indeed. All right. Cheers, jerk. Cheers, bitch. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Devil's Trap Podcast. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, Devil's Trap Podcast, Twitter, Devil's Trap Pod, or you can email us, Devil's Trap at Devil's Trap Podcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe, leave reviews, and share it with all your friends. We're available at all your major podcast listening devices, or you can always find us at Devil's Trap Podcast.com. Thanks. Devil's Trap Podcast is a Don't Be a Dick production. Intro music, arrangement and performance by Dave Cox. Piano arrangement and performance by Bobby Orozco. Meow. <laughs>